Okay. Let's get ready to make a painting. Okay. <laughs> um, audio. Hey everybody, welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski. Today we're going to make a painting that I've wanted to make for 13 years. I've been waiting 13 years for the moment to make this painting, I've been wanting to make it forever and just never had the chance. And today, uh, March 18th, 2021, falls on the 13th anniversary of the very first day that I pub publicly proclaimed my desire to go to the moon and make a painting while standing on the lunar surface. And when I first started talking about this, 13 years ago, it was seen as a big kind of, a, well, some people thought it was, I, I got a lot of media attention. I was on television. There's, you, if you do a little search, you'll find, you can go to my website, which is linked below. And there's a whole page dedicated to uh, the Paint on the Moon project. And uh, I got a lot of press out of it. I was on uh, various different television outlets, newspapers and magazines and internet, radio, all that kind of stuff. So... But I, in, I think a lot of those journalists kind of thought it was kind of a fun human interest story, kind of like cat gets stuck in a tree, artist wants to go paint on the moon, like kind of a funny thing to put at the very end of the news broadcast. And I'll be honest, when I first came up with this idea of going to the moon and making a painting on the moon, the very the, the, it occurred to me in a dream while I was sleeping. And I often have a dream journal and I, I write my dreams the first thing I wake up. And I thought like, oh, like that's a pretty funny thing. And then over the course of that day, it was one of those dreams that just didn't go away. And I start, and I started thinking like, you know, it is kind of interesting that um, we've never sent an artist into space. We've sent school teachers and engineers and lots of soldiers and pilots. Um, scientists, uh, doctors, uh, but we've never sent an artist into space. And, you know, and I thought like, okay, well, that makes sense because, you know, uh, it, it costs, costs a lot of money to send somebody up into space. We want to make sure that uh, that person, you know, if they go up there, they're doing important work and uh, they're, 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 you know, it's a, a good uh, cost benefit analysis there. But, you know, it's, it, as I started thinking about it, you know, there's NASA has been talking about for decades, really since they, the last time that artists went to the moon, about their, the difficulty of getting people excited about space travel. And, and I thought to myself, you know, what's interesting is the, the people whose job it is to get people excited about the unknown, to get people excited about new realms that often frighten people, are creative people, right? Uh, if you go back, like only about maybe 200 years, the very idea of going on a camping trip or going hiking into the mountains, no culture on earth thought that that was a good idea. It was a terrifying place for humans to go because in, in the, the mountains, in the deep forests, were where bears and lions and all sorts of animals could attack and kill you. And it, so it's taken humans like millions of years to get to the point where going into the forests and mountains were seen as interesting. And who gave them that idea? It was artists. Painters and writers were the first people to come up with, like to start looking at the mountains uh, as an interesting place to venture into, right? And then other people started looking at those paintings. Uh, many of them were the what we call the Romantic painters. Um, Caspar da David Friedrich was a German painter who uh, did a lot of paintings in the mountains. And that kind of really changed people's perspective. And all of a sudden, yeah, going to the mountains actually sounds like a really fun way of spending uh, some time rather than a terrifying uh, uh descent into possible death right so anyway artists are the ones that go into unusual places 
experience what those what they you know take what they they experience what they see feel smell and touch and then they convert them into um, uh, images and stories poems dances songs that remove the fear and anxiety people have about those new experiences and they disseminate them throughout the culture and then all of a sudden those terrifying things aren't so scary anymore so i want i can rant about this forever because i've had 13 years to think about it so you're seeing here on the screen an image that i created um and here's the actually the, this is the very very first image i created 13 years ago to help kind of describe this idea and this is a photograph taken by um, one of the apollo astronauts i believe this is um buzz aldrin standing here and this is a photo by neil armstrong i'm pretty sure and obviously i inserted this drawing or um, i took a an image off the web and i cut it out and i used photoshop to insert it here to help me visualize that idea and i make sketches like that Here's one I made years later. I don't know how, maybe maybe five years ago I made this. A little bit more sophisticated kind of image as I got to know Photoshop a little bit better. So this is the original. Here's the more recent version. And then you'll see link below to a Dropbox folder. And I'll show you that in a second. But there's some tracings of those same images which you can use. I'll just show you here. If we go on, click on that Dropbox link, it takes you down here to, uh, there's six different files. You saw, basically it's, it's really just <laughs> this image and then the original, this image and the original. The only difference is there's a PDF version of the tracings that if you want to use those, you have those available to you as well. So, um, and, you know, while I'm here, there is the uh, private Facebook for people that are um, people like you who might be watching me right now. Many of you have belong to the group now. And usually at the after each episode, people post their version of the painting. So I just want to show a couple things I, that I think are super exciting. Here's uh, on Tuesday, we did a painting of the Mona Lisa. And so here's Gail's version of the Mona Lisa. Look at that. And here's Josh, a new viewer here. Here's a version of um, the uh, Build Trailer uh, uh, painting that we, we did. And we actually did, or we did one of them, but I put up a number of templates for them. Oh, that's cool. And here's Shelly's version of the Mona Lisa. Right, so I think it's super cool. I love, it just blows my mind sometimes when I just look at this and I think, this is so neat. Look at all these people who are making art. Um, and I don't know how many people thought they could paint the Mona Lisa before. It blows my mind that people are painting it now, right? Okay, so if you, pr if you uh, download those files, you can print them out. Here's the two um, outlines. I'm going to transfer them onto Canvas right now. I haven't had a chance to do this in advance. Um, so the way that I'm going to do it is I use carbon paper. And the links for these are down below. If you want, you could paint on a black uh, uh, background. And then you could use white graphite paper to trace white outlines onto your black or green or yellow canvas. I'm going to use this uh the black tracing paper let me see i'm looking for one that hasn't been used too much i used, started one just the other day let me see okay let's get this out of the way crinkle crinkle okay so I'm going, to, I'm going to quickly outline both of them, and I'll get both of them started. Now, you're welcome to, to take this image and modify it and change it however you like. I'm obviously, I'm going to paint um, the image of the astronaut painting, 
But if you wanted, you could the astronaut could be playing a saxophone or a guitar or uh, composing music with other astronauts who are standing by watching um, a concert on the moon. And you know, I, I, I again, when I first started talking about this, I think that a lot of people thought it was quite funny, but I, I think it was very hard for anyone to... Uh, I think everyone at the end of the day admitted at some point barring some horrible nuclear holocaust, that eventually there is going to be somebody standing on the moon, on, on Mars and Jupiter and all over the solar system and beyond, making a painting. Is it going to happen within the timeline that I've set out for myself, January 1st, 2030? I sure hope so. Um, but if it doesn't, it will eventually happen. So as ridiculous as it may sound right now, it will actually happen. I have, uh, I, I am absolutely quite certain of it, that, um, you know, it's the same sort of thing if you think about any kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, expedition or, um, even just people like a small town, right? Let's say you have a, a small town in the countryside and it's and it's starting to get bigger and bigger. You know, maybe when there's a thousand people living in the small village, they don't have an art museum or an art gallery, but as it gets to a certain size, you know, they might get an art gallery, they might have a, you know, I don't know, community center they build, and then eventually... A subway station, not the well, maybe the restaurant too, um, the fast food restaurant. But uh, you know, just like anything, as human cultures expand, you know, there's the uh, um, the opportunities for more diverse uh, um, occupations become available, right? If you think of Pretty much, well, any town here in North America, right? There's, like here, I'm in Vancouver, and uh, Vancouver for a long time, I'm very interested in history, and Vancouver for a long time was seen as kind of a bit of a, a small town, uh, like a, you know, on the fringes of the world, and... You know, so if you had told somebody, I don't know, a hundred years ago that one day there would be, let's say, a, a, a big hockey team and there would be a giant football stadium and all this kind of stuff and people would be looking around at, um, you know, the a couple of wooden shacks in the forest and said, are you kidding me? That's ridiculous. So it will happen. And part of my goal in in putting this um, uh, this idea out there was to get the conversation started, so that people did start talking about it. And long story short, I've been talking about this now for ten years or thirteen years, and enduring a, a fair share of of ridicule and skepticism. And actually, my uh, my wife and I, we were, um, where were I'm trying to think where we were. Uh, we were, where were we were somewhere. I remember we were uh, flying somewhere, and and when we got off the airplane, my phone had blown up, and I had all these messages on my phone, and it was like, what on earth is going on? People like, you know, are are you gonna go? Are you gonna are you talking to this guy? And I'm like, what guy? What are people talking about? And it turned out while I was on the airplane, um, Yusaka Maezawa, who is uh, a, a... He's basically the Jeff Bezos of Japan. He founded a kind of like Amazon website that is very popular in Japan. Um, and 
while I was on the plane, him and um, it's so hard to th <laughs> to think and do this kind of stuff at the same time. Um, Maezawa and Elon Musk, uh, Elon Musk, the the founder of Tesla and the Boring Company, and uh, uh, I mean a whole bunch of other different things, but but SpaceX is is one of his big things. So um, Elon Musk and Maezawa appeared on a press conference saying that they were going to send a rocket to the moon. And not only that, that Maezawa was going to be on that rocket, and not only that, that Maezawa declared that he was going to um, spend a billion dollars on this trip. And instead of just taking, you know, his, his wife or best buddies or whatever, he was going to take eight artists with him on this journey. And so, so that as soon as that news kind of hit, I got all of these messages from journalists that I had talked to over the years, who were who remembered our conversations and um, and immediately reached out and wanted to talk to me. And so, of course, I did a whole bunch of a lot of press and um, was on the front cover of uh, the Vancouver Sun and the. What is the other big Vancouver newspaper, or the province newspaper out here? Um, and was inside pretty much every newspaper across Canada. Um, because all these, all these journalists, <laughs> like, hey, remember that conversation? Um, this big, this sort of thing is on the news right now. And so it was, for me, it was very... Uh, validating that this thing that I've been talking about that sort of got a, a, a little chuckle from people all over the place um, all of a sudden I didn't seem like such a nutty person with some kind of outlandish idea it was uh, kind of seemed like maybe I <laughs> I I I wasn't so crazy after all, I guess, would be the... the... So, um, long story short, let's see how this turned out. Cool. So we got one image on the canvas. Now, there's, I'm obvious, I'll do a little bit of tweaking on here when we get going. Just getting the composition on there is a big, important step. And not only uh, did, and so as soon as all that that media attention came out, one of the exciting things about that is uh, Yusaku Maezawa started liking a bunch of my uh, posts on Instagram, and um, and a bunch of my posts kind of went viral and. <laughs> Uh, which is all very, very exciting to have this guy that you're seeing on the news talking about this thing that you've always wanted to do, and then all of a sudden they are actually, um, you can, you know that they are looking at your work and they know who, he knows who I am. There was a uh, Japanese film crew that was going to come out here and film a documentary <laughs> on me at one point um, and uh, I think they just, I think that well the the guys one of the, the journalists said that they might not have the budget after all for that which was kind of disappointing I was quite excited for for a few days that I was going to be featured in a Japanese documentary um, but uh, anyway, I, I, and then I also, so I've done a few different, um, besides having done lots of media, as I said, you can find, there's, if you do a quick search, you'll find lots of videos and articles and um, things with me talking about it. And I also did 
essentially like a TED talk um, for an organization called Nerd Night. And they're, they have, um, it's sort of like TED, they have these, I think they're monthly gatherings around the world. And they invite different speakers to, to speak to, uh, to kind of talk about what their research is about and what they're working on and some of the interesting findings. And the idea is to try to present that information in an accessible way and to, to make science entertaining for um, your so-called regular person like myself. And so they invited me to come and, and speak to their audience, which I had thought was going to be mostly scientists. And there was a lot of scientists in the crowd, but there was also just a lot of people who were really interested in, um, in learning about what other, about, you know, what, what's going on in the world ultimately, right? And afterwards... A number of people came up to me after my talk, and you can watch my talk. I, I actually put the link to it down in the video description below. And after that, I had a whole bunch of people come up and, and start talking to me. And I ended up interviewing a bunch of very interesting people with the intent of making a podcast. And I've got all of these uh, conversations recorded. I just have not yet had the opportunity to to really put them out into the world, but that was also really interesting because I started, <clears throat> you know, reaching out to some of the the leading kind of astrophysicists and astrobiologists and um, and really kind of getting into the research side of this whole project. And um, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the, the scientists that I talked to, I think my project really resonated with them because one of the things that scientists, uh, that, you know, the people I talked with is, you know, they always, ha they have a difficulty getting the public interested in what they're doing. And the way that scientists get funding is by, you know, uh, I mean, ideally, there's the government and, and individuals who will fund research regardless because they think it's good for humanity to advance um, with its research and, and technology. But... I was really surprised to hear how difficult it is for scientists to get funding for things. And so they often, you know, uh, spend a lot of time thinking about how to uh, convey their research and the importance of their research to the public. And they really gravitated towards my whole project because they thought like, huh, you know, here's somebody who's obviously getting a bunch of uh, press for what they're doing. Um, maybe we could collaborate on something. You know, maybe there's an opportunity for uh, me as a scientist to piggyback on his project. And maybe that way I could get funding for my own thing. You know, if I can help him develop paint that will, will work in... Uh, both extreme cold temperatures and extreme heat. Maybe there's a way that um, I could get that project funded, which might also help this other thing that I'm working on. Oh, so we see. One thing, I, after I, I do this, I always just do a quick little check. Make sure everything there is missing an arm. Okay, looks good. Good enough anyway, right? Because we're going to paint over all of this and a lot of it's going to get hidden. So I don't want to spend too much time in, at this kind of stage on this process. Okay. So now I've got these two canvases side by side.
that we are going to paint on. I'm so excited. I've been wanting to do this for so long. Um, the other thing, I am going to... Um, my daughter and I went to Science World yesterday, a, a kind of like science museum here in Vancouver, and in the gift shop on the way out, I got some of the, the astronaut ice cream, and then I saw these space snacks, and I'm like, oh, this will be perfect, because often I get a little bit hungry while we're doing these episodes, so I'm going to have some astronaut ice cream. It's been probably 30 years since I've had astronaut ice cream, since when I was a little kid, I remember that was like a big thing when I was a little kid, and then it kind of disappeared. You just stopped hearing about astronaut ice cream. Um, and so, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm going to taste it again for the first time in a long time. Okay. So, I get out all my paints. Remember, I can do everything with, all, with just these, um, the six basic w warm and cool colors. And um, a little bit of black and white. Now we're going to use black and white to make some gray. There's going to be a lot of gray in today's paintings. But, and this goes to a whole other thing just about the moon, is that the moon appears gray and lifeless and boring. And, you know, there's it, just like this empty vast empty landscape and to that I, I when I look at these images I just think wow look at all the incredible colors right when I look at this image I see purples and blues and pinks and greens and reds right and I'm not talking about in here I'm talking about just looking around here yeah and there's yes maybe some of that is the light coming into the picture um, from the the sun, but it's going to be reflecting off all of those surfaces, right? If you have a surface that is mostly gray and white, then it is reflecting a lot of light. If it was totally black surface, it would be absorbing all of that light and maybe far less colorful. But I look at an image like this, and if anything, I'm a, kind of overwhelmed with color, right? Because the, there's a lot of color but the new, it's very subtle nuances of color. So, okay. So where should we begin on these paintings? Good, good question, Michael. <laughs> I'm gonna have a sip of my uh, NASA tea. But uh, don't fret, I also have my Canadian Space Agency tea. So I'm... I'm Representing um, the, the my my uh, Canadian aeronautic uh, brothers and sisters as well. Okay, so um, to make this painting, and I, I had a, I was thinking a lot over the course of a little while. How do I want to approach this painting? Do I want to try to do them as quickly as humanly possible? Because if I'm standing on the moon, I'm going to have to paint very very quickly. And I know this because almost 10 years ago, I went to the North Pole with the Royal Canadian or Air Force and was the very first person to make paintings at the North Pole. And so you go to my website, you could check out that. One of these days, I'll do a, a video talking a lot more about that experience, which was mind bogglingly incredible. But and I'm not saying not just talking about when I went to northern Alberta or even, you know, the Yukon where I've been um, uh, I went to the literal tip of Canada at the very very top of Ellesmere Island north of the geomagnetic North Pole and just a little like in between there and the geographic North Pole and um, which is underwater so and we flew over that area. So I've, I've, this, I've, I've, I've been in extreme circumstances and made art in extreme circumstances. And I, and you have to work really, really quickly when you're painting outside in minus 40. On the moon, it can get much colder than that, and yet also much hotter than that because there's no atmosphere. So if you're standing and you have the the sun on your back, right, and you you're casting a shadow. 
where the shadow is, it's like minus 200, but on your back, it's like plus 70, right? Like almost, it's like boiling on your back, freezing on your belly, right? So that's gonna be a whole challenge is how to create materials that can survive in these extreme temperatures. Uh, um, uh, so, <laughs> long story short, how am I gonna start these paintings? Well, good question. I think, and I was thinking about this just this morning, is probably what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mix a gray, and then I'm gonna add, let's say, I'll bring this down here. We'll just look at one of these for a second. I'm gonna paint a gray over this whole thing, and I'm gonna put a little bit of warmer colors in the bottom, and then some cooler colors up here, and we'll kind of blend them together so that we have cooler colors further away, warmer colors closer to us, and that'll help give us a little bit more of depth in this painting. So let's get right to it. To mix this gray, I'm gonna put some white here. Now, I have to be careful how much white I actually paint on the canvas because too much white will um, cover up all my pencil lines. Now, it's, that's not such a big deal. I can always ref I can always do it all over again. I can put that paper on, on top and, and trace it again. It just takes more time. Um, so, let's see. I got my white here. I'm gonna take a bit of this black. So what I'm looking for is sort of what we, we call the, the local color. And I've mentioned this before. The local color is is the the color that um, is, you know, if you think of like an apple, when people say, oh, an apple is red, that's your local color. And you maybe even at the, when you're depending on the, the kind of apple and, and how ripe it is, that red could be a little bit different. But that's the, the, the central color that before it's been uh, made brighter or darker. So I put a lot of water in there, you saw, right? That's gonna help dilute this a little bit. Now, this might be a little bit dark, but I, I, again, I want something that's gonna be kind of right in between white and black. Okay. So, next here, I'm going to, I'm going to make a cool purple and a warm purple. Or I might even just go uh, warm purple and just cool blue. So let's, let's put some of these colors down here onto the palette so we can see what I'm talking about. I'm not going to put everything out here just yet because I won't need everything. That's what I need. Okay, so I'm going to mix this here. Let's take, we're going to make a purple out of it, and we barely need any because we're we don't want this color to to change too radically. We're just going to take a little bit of this color and we're going to add it to this mixture as we go here. Okay, in fact, I won't need that for a little bit, so I'm just going to clean that brush off. Wow, so many comments in the chat there. I, I'll get to it while these uh, paints are drying. So. The other thing I'm going to do, I'm going to add some slow dry medium. 
So I'm going to put this off to the side. I'm, I might as well even put some off on the other side. Because what we're going to do is we're going to paint a little bit. And then we're going to blend a little bit. So I'm going to, I have a brush for doing some blending. And I'm going to use... Sometimes I swear, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I think some of these brushes, they just, they get up and they leave <laughs> at some point. And I'm just like, where did they go? What's going on? Okay. So I'm going to take, let's take a bit of this slow dry medium. I'm going to just blend it into, I'm not mixing any purple in just yet. Okay. Might as well just, I'm going to go right up into the sky here, even though this is going to be kind of black, but it'll just make things a little bit easier if I... Huh? Okay, so now I'm just going to take a bit of my purple here, and I'm just going to mix it in a little bit down here. So this is my slow dry medium with a bit of purple. Oops, a little bit of blue. That's okay because it's a nice, it's a warm color. And let's just take this. It's pretty subtle right there. Let's just get, I'm just getting a little bit more of my brush. almost imperceptible kind of change there, which is good. I, I actually am happy with that. And then let's just do the same thing. I'm going to take my cool blue. And let's, I should have scooped my paint out first, so we'll just... A little too much blue in there. Diluted, and let's just take this. So this is, you know, a little bit overkill. I realize that there's, it, it's probably not really showing up on the screen much at all. But for me, it's, it's just helpful to, it's also kind of like putting myself in a bit of a mindset really of, of warm and cool colors. Yeah, so it's it, and it, there's it's a little distracting because there are shadows going all over the place, but it looks pretty even to me. On um, so it's, I mean, it's almost imperceptible that I've got warmer purple here going into some cool. Um, I wonder if I should try to just for the sake of the television make this. A little bit more extreme. 
think about it as we do this. Okay. Um, where did I put my slow dry? There we go. I'll just get these brushes here. Put some slow dry medium right in here, just because I mixed this a little while ago. So here's my gray. So you know, let's say I was painting on the moon. What I would probably have is a bunch of canvases already primed like this with a, with a color already on it. I was thinking about making like much more luminous kind of painting with kind of glowing light coming from within. And I thought, I really just want to create something that is kind of almost pretty factual kind of exp um, image and not get too wonky artisty about it okay I'm just trying to add maybe a little bit more purple into the bottom for the sake of uh, the camera here so it's a little bit more extreme and then let's do the same thing with this cool blue down here that's a little extreme Michael um, let me see might have gone a little little heavy-handed here And there's slow dry medium in all of this as well. Okay. And I'm just using my blending brush or mop brush to kind of mix these kind of cools, the, the warm and cool colors together a little bit more. And to kind of thin it out a bit more so I can see some of those pencil lines a little bit more clearly through here. My goal is never really to, to do a kind of a gorgeous blending. This is, after all, just my underpainting. It's always just to kind of establish the foundational color kind of hiding underneath everything so that if I don't overlap things perfectly or, or you know these different colors matching up that they that they're the whatever's underneath it is um, it's, it's sort of like my safety net. And again, I don't think it, it comes across on camera very well, but it's very clear to me that this is a uh, warmer color. We got a bit more of a purple and a cooler color up here. So let's just clean up these brushes before we move on to the next step. So we'll let both of these paintings dry. Yeah, so what I would do is I would have panels primed like this with a color. Maybe it would be gray, maybe it would be uh, yellow or kind of a uh, warm orange or warm brown, which is, is much more typical if you're painting on earth anyway. <laughs> um, 
So having, and without any drawing on it, I would just have panels like this. I might have an arrow on the back saying what's up and what's down so that I could just pull it out and then start painting right on top of it. And that's what I did when I was painting at the North Pole. Um, I, I learned pretty quickly the first couple days I was trying to paint. Um, I was just like, I'm going to go out there and I'm just going to kind of experience things. And then I'll kind of take what I've learned and then try to make paint. Uh, and then I'll, which, which worked out because one of the things I realized trying to paint at, at the North Pole in the middle of, well, when, when I was there, March, March, April, May. Um, okay. I just lost the tip of one of my brushes just fell down there. When I was at the North Pole, one of the things that never occurred to me is it's very, very bright. Remember I was talking about how much reflected light there is going to be on the moon? Same thing at the North Pole. It was super, super bright, so I had to wear glass sunglasses the whole time while I was painting, which I had never done before because... Um, when you're wearing sunglasses, it makes mixing paint a little bit tricky, right? Because what looks good to your eyes when you're wearing sunglasses, when you take those sunglasses off, you're like, oh, that's a different color than I was expecting it to be. It looks great with my sunglasses on, but most people are not going to walk into an art gallery and look at paintings wearing sunglasses. Some of those things that you just don't expect until you're actually going to do it. So, I think... I think that's finally the end of this paintbrush, which you've probably seen me trying to, you know, I've been repairing it on and on for the past few months. Okay. <clears throat> so let's, um, uh, I want to just take a look at, oh, look at all these comments. This is cool. Wow. Whoa. Um, so there's Paula's here and Deborah and Heidi and Shamza. Hey Shamza, great to see you again. Um, he says yes, it excite it is exciting. Thank you, Michael. A good time for the day, Deborah. Hi everyone. The moon is the First Nations. The moon in the First Nations tradition is referred to as Grandmother Moon. Hey, I am a grandma. When you go, Michael, just look down on us and smile on us. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'll be I'll be smiling for sure on the moon. Absolutely. I'll be very happy when that happens. Um, <laughs> uh, Heidi says, Michael seems quite drawn to the space outside of our planet. Go join them. <laughs> and the reflection on his helmet, well done. Um... <laughs> Deborah says, I have difficulty leaving my kids and grandkids, so I will just send Michael off in my steed. Um, that's definitely, you know, now that I've got a daughter, it is like, oh, I, I just, I start thinking about kind of a trip like that. And, and um, it does make, I just dropped our daughter off at, uh, at the nannies, but an hour ago and that was traumatic that was difficult I don't, I, this is gonna take me a while to psych myself up for a much longer much more dangerous journey um josh says i'm excited to start this project uh, deborah says heidi i'm in excellent health and was a dancer maybe as a grandma and dancer i can go to the moon and dance there yes absolutely yes well i think that's one of the really cool things about Mayazawa's. um uh, whole goal this dear moon project as he calls it is taking artists to go with him to outer space and the idea of inviting a dancer or a poet a filmmaker a, a, um, a, a novelist you know a, a, a choreographer a theater writer um, you know and I just I mean again I've been talking about how how important it is to take artists to these unknown places to help them uh, experience it and describe that for other people. Like another project I did years ago, uh, I guess it would have been like six, seven years ago, six years ago, is I got to fly in um, a fighter jet plane, the, a CF-18 Hornet, with the Royal Canadian Air Force, and I got to go, um, you know, which is the 
the, the main fighter plane in the Canadian Air Force, the Royal Canadian Air Force, and I got to go faster than the speed of sound, and I was making landscape drawings the whole time. And we're fl doing flips and turns, and um, like when you're going at like, uh, you know, eight Gs, and you're pulling these turns, like all of a sudden, like my hand would weigh more than a bowling ball, and I could not lift my hand off of, like my, my sketchbook was strapped to my knee, and I'm trying to draw, and my hand was just like uh, rattling, and there was a couple times where my head was down while I'm drawing, and then we go into these turns, and I I got actually quite bad whiplash because the the strain the of my head being pulled down into my lap was so intense that I had these visions of my head just tearing off and falling into my lap and then looking up at my at my neck where my head used to be. Because it was like it's the, the those the power of gravity on your body in those situations is so intense. Um, Okay, cool. So I, there's a bunch of questions in the chat that I'm going to get to in a moment here. I just want to really get these paintings off on the run here. Um, and then I know that you, you know I have no trouble talking. <laughs> so uh, um, I will, I won't, but so I won't. I need to keep myself moving forward here rather than engage uh, in um, 
my blather. So I'll, I'll uh, some great questions in the chat that we'll get to. Okay, so another th so again we're going to use mostly grays and we're going to modify those grays with these different colors as we go along and so this kind of a painting it, it reminds me a lot of when we did the artemisia gentileschi painting right the um the allegory of talent which we did i think back in january i would say it was one of the final paintings we did for our uh, basic acrylic uh, class or intro to acrylic class and the way we made that painting is we painted the entire painting in gray, or as it's known as a grisaille painting. And then we did some washes with color over top of it, really, really semi-transparent or mostly transparent, um, adding color to, in fact, let's see if I can find that painting off the top of my head here. Uh, Somewhere in here. Okay, here it is. All right, so if you remember, we did a gray version and then we added color over top of that. All right, so we're going to do something similar to the Artemisia painting, except we're, instead of doing the two step method where we're painting all gray and then adding color, we're going to mix a little bit of color into the gray as we go. And we can almost kind of imagine that this surface is that gray painting that we're adding color to, right? So, the next uh, thing here, let's take a look at this here. So what I, I love about starting with a primed, um, well, we've got like a, a canvas that's primed with obviously gesso and stuff, but then now we've added a, a wash over top of it, is that this wash is kind of in between the light and the dark. So now it's a, rather than going, taking a, a white canvas and then slowly making everything darker and darker and darker, um, or starting with a black canvas and making everything lighter, we're sort of in the middle, right? And we, we can go this way and this way. And that is also gonna force us to add more contrast into our image. Because one of the things that happens often when we're painting, and I do this all the time myself, even I did it in the Leonardo painting, I mean, mostly because I ran out of time, but it's it, it, um, it can be scary to add contrast to a painting. Go like, <gasps> add, I'm so afraid to go put actual white onto the canvas or adding black like oh so we often we stay in these very narrow ranges of color and when we use a canvas like this it forces us to go into the more extreme higher contrast you know black and white so what should we do first on here i think just for the sake of um Personally, if I was going to be painting this painting entirely on my own, I would probably start working on the background and kind of nail a bunch of that and then put these things on top of it. Um, but I think for if anyone's following along trying to paint with me, they may... F and I've noticed this over many of the episodes we've done so far, that if I do that, sometimes people lose the the actual foreground images or the faces because they've, they've got a bunch of other things going around here so i think just for the sake of 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 doing this uh with people watching who might be trying to follow along i'm actually going to paint a rudimentary version of my foreground details and then go back into some of the background stuff okay so now that i've explained what i'm going to do let's do what i'm going to do so i need some more white we're gonna mix some more gray. I guess I didn't really need that black. Um, okay, so let's just get some white on our brush. A little bit of black on here. Okay, 
so we're we're kind of similar kind of gray to what we put on the background maybe maybe we'll start off we'll do some of the lighter colors first a little bit of the lighter um values and then we'll we'll kind of go darker lighter darker or lighter darker lighter darker back and forth and so right now this is just pure pure gray and you can maybe this is not too it's a little bit like has a little bit more white than this but the the main difference is that this has got a lot more color into it right so now you can probably see oh now i can see that he's got because you know before when i was painting i'm like i can't really see any purple or blue in there anyway so i'm gonna add little bits of infinitesimal amounts of color into my gray as we're painting here so um i'm gonna get a smallish brush I'm just gonna scoop all this paint on here because rather than just putting it into a rag we can use it okay put that in my water um <laughs> you got some great questions josh okay but let me let me um start this and then i'll i'll answer questions as we go here um okay so, our foreground figure, we're going to want warmer colors in the foreground, right? So these, this kind of uh, warm blue, warm red, warm yellows, those are, are going to be, if I'm going to add or modify my gray, I'm going to want to use some of these colors. If I want it to be in the background, I'm going to use my cool yellow, my cool blue. And my cool reds right cool yellow cool blue and cool red for background warm yellow warm red and warm blue for my foreground so let's let's dip in here into we're gonna mix a bit more of this purple Okay. So that's kind of a nice warm it's a it's warmer purple because it's got some blue on here. The the ultramarine blue, which is a nice warm color. So we're gonna need a lot more slow dry medium. Just pour a bunch on there. So that color is going to stay really open for probably the next 10, 20 minutes, right? And then I'm going to take, you're going to see me <laughs> going all over this palette today. But I'm going to take this and I can just rub my paintbrush in here. And depending on how much I put on my brush. Right. Okay, so let's, uh, let's start painting here. It's still a bit tacky, but... So I'm going to just paint quickly some of these details, like this backpack here. All right. Where's another kind of a highlight? This light is kind of coming in from behind. All right, so we, that's what's casting the shadow down here. So I'm just sort of getting the outer parts of the body. Basically, I'll just kind of outline the whole body like this, really. Okay. Um, and it's gonna work, it'll get brighter Obviously, we'll, we'll have some more intense highlights shortly. But let's now take this same color. Let's add a little bit more blue to it, or more of the 
color that we had before. And so it's so right now it's it's almost totally neutralized, right? It's like basically the same color as the background. So we can keep we can use that color, but let's just darken it up a bit. That's a little too much black. Okay, so this is going to go much darker. And I'm going to use a smaller brush, too. So this is kind of the interior of the shadow. So much darker, right? And part of the trick of this painting is to is adding the nuance that's required. So um, let's even go a little bit darker, even. So where are some of the darkest parts? It's often darkest right before it gets brightest, right? You hear it's like it's dar the it's darkest before sunrise, or what's the I don't know how the saying goes, but it's something like that. So I'm just really quickly adding the, the 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 kind of the darker points in here. And and it'll make also make more sense when we start painting the background in and around it as well. And really, I'm, I'm using almost no color at this point either. So it'll get more colorful as we go. So let's move on to this easel here. And actually, you know what? The easel, I'm going to mix a little bit of a brown. I'm going to mix a warm brown. I'm just going to take my warm yellow, my warm red, and my warm blue together make a brown 
Now, obviously, if I was painting on the moon, I'd probably be using some kind of aluminum um, easel uh, <laughs> rather than a wooden one. But I think just for the... It's kind of fun to think of this as being like a wooden easel. I think just visually, I think it, it's... For me, anyway, it's just it's kind of funny. So I'm, I'm going to keep, keep that image here. So let's scoop... Gray here. Mix it into here, this brown. Okay. So I'm not even going to worry about making, like right now, it's, you can see I'm applying these, these brush strokes and they're almost like a little bit sloppy. Um, but I don't, I don't mind because as I said, the way that I'm going to work on this painting is paint mostly the foreground. And then when I paint the background in, I can kind of clean up the foreground a bit. You know, if you just get the 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 local color in, like this brown, then we can always modify it with washes and things over top at the very end, and um, and, and uh, I also see there's two different easels in these different images, which is fine. Right, so I, I'm gonna. I'm not even worried about like the nuances, the light and the dark. I mean, I could do a little bit. In fact, let's do a tiny bit. We'll add a little bit of black to this. It is a little easier to do this when the paint's a bit wet, but. That's going to be interesting painting the painting. Um, okay, so we got the brown. And you know, maybe while I've got that brown painted, I wonder if I can do just a bit of this on this painting. This is one of the reasons why I like using painting on two canvases at the same time. Is that if I mix a color, I can use it on two paintings right away. you're like oh no what about all the the detail and the and that original tracing that's all gone i'm not you know just and i again this is my own way of painting i'm not saying that my way of painting is the only way of painting the best way of painting this is just the way that that um 
I've been painting for years after having tried many different styles of painting and the, the kind that works what best for me. You know, part of the reason why in in the uh, how to paint class we used so many different we explored so many different styles of painting is I wanted to expose people to lots of different styles and techniques and that's what we're doing here too is uh, with my master um, study class trying all these different styles in hopes that people can start finding you know that something hits and they're like ah you know what I love doing poor paintings like Helen Frankenthaler or I love painting um, more expressively like Betty Goodwin um, and then or I really like painting much more technical kind of painting like Artemisia Gentileschi and that's just a fun name to say. Artemisia Gentileschi. Um, and, you know, there's lots of other artists teaching classes on YouTube. And I encourage you to, to, to take and, 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 and paint along with them, too. And, um, and I know many of you are doing that. Many of you guys post things on the on the uh, in the group you know paintings you're doing in other classes and I think that's great I, I think there should be more of that the more you expose yourself to different artists technique and styles I think you will find it um, like a, a really important learning lesson because you start to really you learn really mostly about yourself and, and what comes most naturally to you and what you're most excited about doing. So as I'm painting these, I'm thinking to myself, how much detail do I want to put in these paintings, Michael? And, and part of that is also it really comes down to also how much time do I want to spend on these paintings, Michael? And I say, Michael, that's a great question. You always have the greatest questions, Michael. <laughs> and uh, um, the answer, uh, that's why I like painting in kind of these, these three to four hour sessions, is it really forces me to try to get uh, paintings done a little bit faster. Now I, I was, I saw in, in the, on the Facebook group earlier today. Oops, you know what? I'm ready. I got the wrong painting up on the screen while I'm painting this painting. Anyway, uh, um, I, I'm sorry. I can't remember who it was, but someone was saying how they painted. I think it. Which one was it? It was the. Um, It was the Jacob Lawrence painting, the baseball, the strike painting. We spent like 17 hours, they said they spent painting that painting. And I'm like, whoa, that's a long time to spend on a painting. And, um, you know, if you're painting a painting and you're enjoying it for 17 hours, that's awesome. If you can, if you can stay focused on a painting for that long, and 17 hours probably means you're not painting on it for 17 hours straight, but more like, you know, every couple of days you add two or three more hours, and then two or three more hours, and slowly you're adding more and more time into that painting. Um, if you do that that's awesome and it's if it's holding your attention and you're happy that's great no problems on, on, I have nothing to say about that but if um, if you're spending 17 hours making a painting and it's causing you deep 
unhappiness and frustration, um, then I would say then you don't need to be spending that much time on it. You could either give up on the painting and try something else, um, or you can walk away from a painting. Not every painting needs to be finished. Right? We talked about Leonardo uh, da Vinci in, in our most recent uh, masterclass on Tuesday, and he's famous for abandoning paintings. There's, there's, I wonder how many Leonardo paintings there are in existence. I'd say maybe less than 50, probably. And I would say at least a third of them are unfinished. So, um, again, you're in great company if you, if, uh, if you choose not to finish all of your paintings. So, I'm just, I'm working on here now that I've got, uh, the, the, I, I mixed up this brown, and I'm like, oh, you know, let's use some of this brown. Now... I'm, I'm obviously going to, I'm not going to paint it in this very, like, uh, expressionist Van Gogh kind of style. Mine will be a little bit more, quote-unquote, realistic. It'll probably be more impressionist. Um, so now I'm thinking, what should the back of this canvas look like? And even the side. Um, the sides, I'm just, so I've just been mixing more and more yellow into this brown, by the way. If you're wondering how I get this color. So I'm just going to take this yellow. For me, this part of the pro painting process, I enjoy this part of the process, um, but it, it's I find it very time-consuming and slow. So I try to do this part of the painting process as quickly as possible. And by this part, what I mean is, is really sort of just the filling in of color. You know, I'm just sort of as quickly as possible getting paint onto the canvas, even if it's the wrong color, the quote unquote wrong color, just having it, having something here is really important. Because, you know, we don't really know what we want often until we see it. You know, often when we're painting a painting, you know, we, we look at a blank canvas, like, ah, I don't know, blank canvas is driving me crazy. What should go here? Sometimes you just need to put some paint on there. And putting that paint on there, you're like, okay, that's not what I want there. But I, until I put it there, I would have no idea what needed or didn't need to be there at all. So... You just sometimes just have to just do it and throw some paint onto the canvas, see what it looks like. If you don't like it, then you don't have to accept it. You can just paint over it. But until it's there, you're, it's, it's like, I don't know, I... to mix this um, forgot. how are these pieces going to stay together and need to be joined up here 
Again, so right now I've got kind of the local colors for all of for this easel. I'm going to add more color as we go here, but I think that's pretty good. So I'm just going to come back to this one and we'll keep on going. The other reason why I really like painting on two canvases at the same time beyond the fact that um, I can kind of do two paintings at once. And obviously it takes longer. I think it takes less time though than it does painting them individually. Um, beyond that I can mix one color and use it in multiple places, but it sort of, it forces me out of, I can't, it's hard to really obsess about one picture when you're, when every 20 minutes or so you're, you're, sort of saying goodbye to it temporarily and working on something else you know you're if you get kind of stuck on one it's just like you know what uh let's just let's just put this aside let's take a little bit of a um, um a break and work on a different painting and then often when that happens sometimes i i, I pick up that painting that i had set aside for a little while and i start working and i i'll be like oh i remember i thought there was something wrong with this painting what is what was so wrong about it that was driving me crazy i can't remember right and then and you're like oh well i don't know I, I guess whatever it was is not a problem anymore because i just can keep on moving right i love that feeling of forgetting what was wrong with my painting So I think what I'm going to do now, I'm going to paint the shadow. So I'm going to paint some of this shadow down here and in this crater. Well, they're going to be slightly different. This one's going to be much warmer, more blue, purple. This one is starting to get colder. And then we'll start doing some of that stuff in the background. And we'll see, I'm, I'm, I haven't even really thought about how I'll approach that painting, part of the painting. So I've already got this purple I had mixed before, so I can keep that. Um, so... We're gonna go, it's gonna be much darker, kind of a, I'm not gonna go full on black just yet. I wanna kind of build up to that high contrast. All right, so what I'm adding here So I had gone black, I, I took some black, I took some warm blue and mixed it together, and then I just added a bit of white back into this. Right, so in one of the very first classes we did in our intro painting class, we talked about the difference between adding black to a color, adding white to a color, and adding gray to a color. And the results were quite surprising, I think, for a lot of people. A lot of, like some people really liked the, the effect of the, of black in a color and some people preferred adding gray or dark gray to a color because they're different totally different results and in, in how it, it uh, changes color so anyway i've got a really dark blue gray here it's not even really that dark but um let's see Let's now put in some of these the shadows in here. Oh, I think I was saying before I really like or, or I. I find this process is can be kind of slow. So one thing I, I challenge myself to do is to try to do this part of the painting process kind of quickly. 
so that I get something down. And then I just sort of move forward, and then I can modify things later. Because my favorite part of the painting, or of any of making any painting, is the last like few hours of the painting, depending on, on how <laughs> kind of complex the painting is. Um, I like the very beginning, kind of figuring out what it is and that I'm going to paint. And then I like the last stages. All of this is fun, but I just kind of think of it as kind of like filling things in. I just want to fill it in as quickly as I can. And so I'm very unprecious at this stage of the painting. Which I think is, that's something that I've learned over the years of painting. When when I began, I would spend the, my the most time at this stage. And the, the kind of end of the painting was a bit more of like an afterthought. And I realized that um, at least for the way that I paint, that that was a bit of an error. And I notice when I'm teaching classes that the that this part of the painting is often where people obsess over details and paint things over and over again and are trying to fix things. And, and it's like, why even bother? Like... Because I'm not going to, I, I want to get just everything in place as quickly as possible. Okay, cool. And you know what? Maybe while I've got this color mixed, I'm going to put this in the shadows on here as well. I like this kind of color for the foreground. I haven't forgot about all your questions, Josh, and I don't mind you asking them either. Uh, I'm just uh, I get as far into this painting as quick, both of these paintings as quickly as I can. realized this didn't go I didn't uh, I didn't go easel leg down far enough So with this shadow, I'm kind of making it a little bumpy and rough because 
you know, this is an uneven terrain. If this was on like a gymnasium floor or something, right, then this could be um, uh, you know, I, would, I might have very straight lines here, but I'm thinking like, oh, these are craters and things that the boulders and little rocks and all these different things I'll add eventually to this as well. Um, speaking of which, while I'm here, where's my drawing? So I'm going to get. these things out of like footprints in fact so when we think of like the light is coming down from one side right it's going to be casting shadow so um, uh, like one side is going to be is catching the light and one side's going to be darker. All of these shadows are going to be, I want them to be cooler as they go in the background. I'm just drawing them in here just so I have an idea of where they're going to go eventually. supposed to be a leg that's okay but let's just now put just like little rocks and stuff all over the place a little bit of texture quickly Little tiny dabs of little rocks here. Okay. You know what? Let's, uh, I'm going to outline part of some of the darker. Part. Um, actually, you know what? We'll come back to this here. It's a little bit more complicated just because it's closer to the astronaut is closer to us, so we need to put a little more detail in in there. So I'll come back to that shortly. Um,
just kind of got my drawing kind of a little bit out here to refer to. I think that's that's also one of the helpful things about doing a drawing uh, before you even begin painting, which you know this might be a, a good reason to do my my drawing class. Is um, doing a drawing kind of helps you, or helps me anyway. I, although I I don't think I'm the only one <laughs> um, to organize my thoughts, really think about my composition where things need to go and all these little things that um, rather than so I can kind of do some of that thinking uh, on in the drawing rather than on the canvas itself not that I don't love doing, you know, my thinking while I'm painting. Is it? It's just that it can be often. It kind of I'm using a different part of my brain to do some of that, and it can be hard to switch back and forth over and over again. Um, So a little bit of so using the drawing as an opportunity to um, solve those problems is really I find just infinitely helpful. Because I've already sort of I've, it's like I've 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 done a a version of the artwork once already, and even if. You know, you're just tracing my tracing. Already, it's helping you kind of organize your thoughts. There is something as I'm looking at this. Why is that shadow so much longer? I don't know. <laughs> when I did this, what I was necessarily thinking. Um, but You know, some again, some of this stuff that I'm doing here is is just adding random texture. That I can move, remove. Like the moon is a is is a rock with rocks all over it, right? So it if we don't put texture all over the ground, it's going to look weird. It's going to look too. It's going to look strange. So we got to give it attention. We got to give it a bunch of love all over the place here.
Okay. We have all these little footprints. Um, sorry, my head's in the way there for a second. So even though this is going to be cooler c uh, colors eventually here, I'm just uh, going to lay it in with some of my warmer foreground gray. Because even if, if I don't like these colors at this point or later on, I can just paint right over top of stuff, right? Okay. Um. <laughs> so in the chat there, uh, Josh asks, um, question about the North Pole. How is the experience painting the North Pole? It seems very hard. Uh, yes, painting in the North Pole was, was quite difficult. Um, Uh, I was I was painting with oil paint, so that's I, one of the most common questions I get asked about painting the North Pole was, didn't the paints freeze? And question: If I was using acrylic paint, absolutely it would freeze. Um, but I was painting with oil paints, and oil paints have a much lower freezing temperature. Is that or higher freezing? Whatever they um, it needs to be much 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 colder for oil paints to freeze and so actually painting in cold temperatures with oil paint I really really like because it's it's they keep their texture um, they're much more like it's almost like a toothpaste texture painting in cold temperatures I used to um, when I was in uh, graduate school I had a I worked for uh, an artist called James Hayward you can look him up Jimmy Hayward He's a cow, people call him the cowboy painter. Although he didn't paint cowboys, but he walked around with a cowboy hat and cigar, always a big smile on his face. And he lived in a, he, on this ranch outside of Los Angeles. Uh, where was that? What, is it, no, not Rancho Cucamonga. It's been, gosh, 15 years since, since then. But he had his his art studio was refrigerated. Like he had a, a relatively small studio where he did like he had a lot of space. He had a big ranch, but the actual room where he painted was sort of like your walk-in freezer at a restaurant, which may not help many. Well, kind of like a really big bathroom, maybe like or like uh, I guess I would say a big bathroom, and because he made these big these these paintings with thick oil paint and if he painted them and this is Los Angeles so it's quite hot anyway but if he painted them even in a cooler temperature environment all that paint was so heavy it would just slide right off the canvas so by painting in a refrigerated room that the paint would stay on the canvas it wouldn't necessarily dry and I don't know if it dried any faster but it just kept it from from sliding off the canvas um, because they're very highly textured pieces. So 
I actually think painting in cold temperatures with oil paint is not only favorable but desirable. Um, that was something I learned from him. So I wasn't too surprised by the, the difficulties of painting outside in cold temperatures. I think the, the, the light was the thing that uh, caught me by surprise, how bright it was up there, um, and how difficult it is to paint when you're wearing sunglasses, like, because it was just so, so bright, and I have my sunglasses on, you're trying to mix a paint, and then you'd kind of be flipping your sunglasses up to see if the color is right. Um, anyway, that, that was, that was, that was really unexpected. Okay, so... I'm going to now try to do a little bit of some cooler color, cooler grays in the background, right? We've got warmer gray down here. It probably doesn't look too much warmer, but there, it's a bit of a purpley color. And we'll see it more when I juxtapose it with this cooler blue. All right, so that, let's add some black to it so we've got a gray and not just a tint. little bit much, Michael. In fact, we want it to be a little bit darker, don't we? So let's just add a little more black into here. And again, you see how I'm adding just a little bit each time I mix. Um, especially when I'm using like a darker color. So there's some slow dry medium I just put on there. Another thing that would happen, you know, uh, when I was painting at the North Pole is I would mix a lot of the colors beforehand on, on my palette. Because it's also oil paint, you could mix it like a week before you actually start painting. But that would allow me to have everything really ready to go. So by the time I went outside, I just had to paint. I had, I, because I had the fortune of being able to be up there for a few weeks painting every single day and so I could I, I really had a I could develop a, a system I could figure out a, a, an approach that worked and test it and the reason why I was up there at the North Pole was because I really saw myself as training to go to the moon and, I, and when I was talking to the Department of Defense about it, that w I made it quite clear that, you know, this is my ultimate goal is to go to the moon and I see this as part of like the training that's required. So. They probably thought I was nuts. Just kind of filling up this background space with that. I don't know if you can really, if it comes across too well, you can see the difference between the, these two grays. So 
so even though this is so that's in the background just like I put some of these warmer colors a little bit into the background I'm gonna take a bit of this cooler color and just you know add it here and there into the foreground as like little specks and not as many but it uh, it also just kind of helps balance things a little bit and don't forget I can always paint things out if I don't like something paint it out Has anyone seen that um, recent film? I think it was a couple of years ago. It came out, First Man. There's a few great because uh, it was the 50th anniversary of the Apollo missions. Just uh, was it this? Time is sort of <laughs> blurred together into kind of one. I, I, like when I think about like last few years. <laughs> Both because we had a daughter and also because of the world coming to an end <laughs> temporarily. I've kind of lost track of when things actually happened, but uh, that was a good movie. The, the kind of more recent documentary, I think, was it called Apollo 11? I think it was also fantastic. Kind of taking some of the footage. The great thing I will say about the, the Apollo missions is the is the wealth of documentation they got tons of photog photographs and video and film um really it's really wonderful the the level of documentation they captured the one thing i think about all the time is you know what they did is they, they trained um air force pilots and, and navy pilots american air force and american navy to to pilot those spaceships and get into outer space and they taught them how to use cameras and to take pictures just think for a moment if instead they had sent photographers professional photographers who had spent 20 years mastering photography if they had sent a great photographer to the moon to take some pictures imagine how different those photographs would be than the photos that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin took and all the other subsequent astronauts who also stepped foot on the moon. You know, like we would, you would never, it would be absurd if I had said to you, you know, we have the most dangerous mission ever. We like, let's say to, to, to go and get bin Laden, right? We, to get bin Laden, what we're going to do is we're going to take a bunch of uh, abstract painters and we're going to show them how to use guns and we're going to train them for a few years on how to become like elite snipers and whatever uh, the green berets or whatever and we're gonna go and, and we're gonna send them in to go and get uh, some terrorists or something You'd be like that's ridiculous why on earth would you do such a ridiculous thing however it didn't seem absurd to anybody to train a bunch of soldiers to take some of the most important photographs in the history of humanity it seemed like yeah well just a photograph anybody could take a camera it takes 10 minutes to show somebody how to you know use the the basic settings on the camera personally what i see i it, it to me just shows kind of how devalued art has become in our culture they was like yeah i don't know i just dude, we'll, uh, tuesday that's where we'll show these uh pilots how to use cameras because it's really important to take some of these important photographs so make sure that the camera's kind of level here's how you set the iso and the shutter speed you know here set the timer and blah, like you know it just to me <laughs> kind of i just think 
Oh, man, that's kind of a bummer that they didn't obviously didn't really res they don't really respect the the uh, the medium of photography very much. They just sort of see it as an afterthought. Um, imagine they had actually taken people whose job it is to to take photographs, and they'd sent them to space instead. Okay, while I've got this gray that I mixed for the background here, I'm just going to add a little bit of that in here. Um, So, you know, it's, this is just, a lot of this right now is kind of, to be honest, kind of sloppy little mark making. Kind of impressionist, pointillist kind of stuff just filling in. So the majority of this cool gray blue is going into the background. Um, another, you know, thinking about Josh's question about how difficult was it to paint uh, up north? Um, a few things, some of the most difficult things that I had to deal with was just getting the paint up to the North Pole. Um, it was kind of funny, you know, the I was I went up there with the Royal Canadian Air Force as part of the War Artist Program, or which is, or it's called the Canadian Forces Artist Program, where they embed civilian um, artists with the military, which they've been doing since World War One, and um, really the, the best Canadian artists of all time were part of the program, so that was why it was a pretty big honor for me to be um, uh, asked to participate. Like, almost all the members of the group of seven were part of that program. I mean, it was called, something, I think it was actually called, what was it called? The, in World War One, they, you know, was, they, uh, you know, Governments, bureaucracies like to rename everything every few years, and, and different uh, a different administration comes in and changes the names of everything. So I can't. I think it was like the War Records Department or War Records Program. Um. Uh, anyway, uh, they. So all those members, uh, like uh, A. Y. Jackson and. Um, Varley, or was yeah, was Varley? Yeah, he was part of the Wars program. Um, not Tom Thompson, because he also was not a member of the Group of Seven. Uh, that's your trivia for today. Okay, um, let's go back to here. Let's 
so right now I've got a, a fairly good rudimentary painting in here. Like I'm pretty happy. I've got both, most of my kind of detail, like the the big areas in place here. Um, I feel like I, I should just take a stab at putting something into this painting. <clears throat> Although, you know what? I feel like I want to put a... a a color over top of this. And I think I'm going to add just a bit of yellow to it. Uh, where should I put this? Let's do this right here. Taking some warm yellow onto the can to paint that canvas just to help create a little bit of a, a separation between it and the rest of the environment around it. Otherwise, it's just going to blend totally into the background, which, you know, some might say, well, that's the point, right? It's supposed to be kind of, or maybe, maybe, depending on what kind of paintings I'd make up there. If you are if you want to see the paintings I made at the North Pole, they're on my website as well. Uh, while I've got this color, I'm actually going to put this same color on the visor here. And I'm going to take a bit of this color and I'm just going to put it in a few places. Let's put a, a few little specks. I need to go with an even smaller brush. Just like little highlights. These are kind of like tiny little reflections on the lunar surface here. That probably is not even visible to you. I'm not sure if you can see any of what I've just been doing. Um, but these are helpful for me. It's just like these little highlights where the sun is hitting some of these rocks. And this was just using the gray and some of warm yellow. While 
I've got that color, let's just do... Oops. Accidentally got a bit of uh, cool yellow on there, so... Which is fine if I want to paint stuff in the background, but... Uh, It's kind of the reflection on the wood there. You see, remember how I said how I would paint this painting is I would paint the background and then the figure. It's basically what I'm doing on this other painting. I didn't even really think about it until I just now I'm like, oh yeah, that thing that I told people I, I wouldn't do because um, I'm teaching and I don't want to confuse people while I'm doing it, confusing people on this, on this one right here. So I guess you get one painting that I'm doing in, uh, in a way that maybe makes it a bit easier for people to follow and then I'm doing one selfishly my own style and method, I guess, or at least approach. I'm just going to paint this whole visor here. Personally, I can, I'm not too worried about being able to recreate that original image or what I, I drew in there it's a pretty small little area so kind of want I just want it to be really bright on there so and I like how in this image it almost appears that the we have like this reflected light from the canvas bathing the the chest of the astronaut. Not sure what's happening here. Is anybody still watching there? I had a kind of a little bit to my computer looked like it was just freaked out suddenly.
one's responding. I hope. Uh, We're still alive. Amy? Can you check and see if I'm still alive here? I, I, something happened. Can you check and just see if I'm still alive? I don't know if... Interesting. Okay. Thanks, love. Okay. See, I just did a little bit of a... I, I tried putting a bit of a highlight on top there, and I didn't like how that turned out, so I just deleted it. Okay. So Lori is responding. Good feed here. Okay, cool. Sometimes the uh, uh, the f it's like the computer just like shut off and rebooted this the program. I'm like, oh oh, is that not good? I don't know why. I think it just does that just to make sure that I'm still alive and paying attention. Or this is the. Uh, I I belong to a bunch of different groups of, of people who do live streaming and people talk about it as sort of being like the wild west that there's it's just like the technology is still relatively you know it's only i mean obviously people have been able to broadcast live with million dollar equipment for decades broadcasting sports sporting events since like the early 50s you know live but for me as a just a guy in his studio or basement doing this and being able to, to for people all around the world to tune in is a little bit different and uh, I think that the, these tools are still in their infancy so okay <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for uh, for letting me know that I'm still um, that I still exist. This is still happening. <laughs> um, okay, I think what I might do at this point is try to bring, let's say, this one to a, a resolution, and then I'll go and f work on that one a little bit after. I'll do that pending time. Um, just. Uh, Thinking about the time, you know what? Okay, I've been, I'm starting to get a little hungry. I can hear my wife up there uh, with her daughter, so I'm gonna try the astronaut ice cream here. Oh, interesting. Comes in. I feel like this is gonna get crumbs everywhere. Even though I think crumbs are like the absolute worst thing that you could possibly have in outer space. A really great book, if you want to read a book about outer space, is called Packing for Mars. Um, I'll put it in the video description afterwards. Okay. What does this feel like? You know what this reminds me of is like a charcoal stick in terms of weight right like so I have these charcoal sticks char or willow charcoal sticks like it this feels very very light like honestly it's it's about as, as heavy as these two brushes so let's try Yeah, I mean, it kind of tastes like it looks, <laughs> you know, as it as it goes into your mouth, it kind of liquefies a little bit. Yeah, 
That is good. But then again, I will eat anything. Right? <laughs> if it's not already obvious. So this is the freeze-dried snack. Oh, it comes in... So what is this? This is... Tropical fruits. I don't even know what... Dried cranberries, freeze-dried pineapple, freeze-dried kiwi fruit, cane sugar. So this must be my cranberry. I mean, it tastes just like the, the ice cream. Pineapple? Can't really hard to taste the pineapple. Cranberry. Vaguely cranberry. I'll eat it. No problem. But I would say this does not have a lot of taste. Kind of like what I imagined chewing on cardboard would be. <laughs> Again, I'll finish the package very quickly, no problem. As it's in my mouth, I feel the taste kind of um, developing, I guess. The bouquet blossoming and unfolding the hints of cardamom and mm, like a chocolatey mm, floral <laughs> okay um, Michael focus what should we do next Definitely, obviously, I'm going to paint the this black. And when we get to that part where it's going to go dark very quickly, and we'll use that uh, darker colors to add darker areas all over here. I think... I think I'm just going to start working on the, on the, the, the astronaut again here. So, what we're going to do is basically just using these grays, or the like the, the purple. So, let's mix a little more purple in here. In fact, we'll make a bigger batch of it that, will probably, that can hopefully sustain us for the majority of the rest of this painting. So, we'll get a purple. A little bit more on the blue side here. And we'll add slow dry medium in there just to keep it alive and open for a while. So we can use this to kind of darken the color and I guess also lighten the color too. But uh, And then let's make some more gray. Let's take the scoop out some white. <laughs> and maybe we'll use a little bit of white for a bit here. Kind of this purpley white. And we'll see. If this goes too purple, then we can always dial it back. 
got astronaut food all over my can my table. <laughs> I hear this crunch, crunch. What is that sound? It's a little bit purpley. I don't mind it. I could imagine some people might, but... Uh... So now I've got like the basic structure of this body here, and I'm just going to start... Um... kind of dialing into some details. Now this overhead camera, that's as zoomed in as I can get it. Um, There's not a lot of highlights in here because he's facing away from the camera. So I just went and added a lot more black into this color. And, you know, this is a pretty small little area that I'm painting. So, and you know what? I'm going to paint that easel a distant. Kind of the, maybe the same, well, maybe not the same color as that. What color could we paint it? Hmm. Kind of a bit of a brown. So we're going to just keep getting darker and darker. And I think I'll put that some of that highlight back on at the very end.
I mean, again, we're you're looking at this is this is about the size of my finger, right? So the amount of detail that we could put in, and one of the artists we're going to talk about in about a month from now is a miniature painter, or, or, or that makes miniature not a not they're not a, an actual miniature human being. They paint miniature paintings. And we'll kind of talk about how to approach that kind of a strategy. Um, but obviously, if you're painting miniatures, you have you you just have to take a long time. You have to take your time to do that kind of thing. And um, a time that I don't have for my own painting right here. While I've got this purple, I'm now just doing little little things here and there, including little specks, even in the shadows. So not you know, sh no shadow is purely black. There's going to be lighter areas in a shadow and darker areas in a shadow. So now I'm just taking, I took some dark blue, and now I'm mixing it with some black. So I've, I still had um, my gray on my, my brush, so it's not like I'm just, it's going to be black, it's, it's a dark bluish um, gray. So now this is sort of my... So shadows are often the darkest right where they touch the object that's casting the shadows. And then they tend to kind of peter out a little bit, right? So where those shadows are meeting, let's say, the, the feet of the astronaut, they're going to be at their darkest. Even in the in the shadow, you see how I'm not just making a big solid block. I'm kind of stippling it a little bit. There's a little bit of astronaut sandwich.
Yeah, that book I mentioned, Packing for Mars, awesome book. I can't remember uh, who wrote what her name. I'm pretty sure it was a female author. Um, yeah, it's 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 really what it's all about is not about space travel. It's it's really about what makes living on Earth so special. Um, because it it really kind of makes you think about how fortunate we are to be on Earth versus any other place in the solar system or beyond. That our Earth is like so perfect for us. Um, and if we like we just wouldn't it survive anywhere else without you know the various different technologies that we now have to survive elsewhere. Um, there's a whole chapter on going to the bathroom in space, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, one of the, they talk about is, is one of the more common questions that, that they are, astronauts are always asked is how do you go number two when you're in a spaceship? And it's actually really fascinating. Like, it's kind of gross, but it's... Um, the other, you know, it's kind of funny too, is back in the 1960s, or yeah, it was 60s, early 70s, they developed the technology to recycle um, human waste into water. They, they could, and they do that on the space station. They, they take uh, the human, um, they take pee, or the, the pee from astronauts, and they remove the pee from the fluid and then they you can drink it again but they also developed the technology to take um, solid waste and to remove the 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 things that you don't want to think about out of it and to turn it back into food and I kid you not they the technology exists to do that but the astronauts, the, and they did, they tested it and stuff, but the astronauts were just so revolted by it that they kind of gave up on, on really investigating that whole idea further because it just was, um, they just found it too disturbing. Um, but I, I just thought that I was super interesting because, you know, it's one of those things I've thought about before, like, I wonder if they can recycle the water. Can they recycle the... Hmm. And the answer is yes. But the astronauts revolted. They were so revolted that they revolted and um, said there's there's no way that they are... I won't even use the, the language that they said, but they would not eat a S-burger no matter how desperate that they were. <laughs> Um, which is fair. I don't know how many uh, of us would uh, eat a hamburger that we knew had um, was made of uh, of well, you, you can think, imagine it yourself. <laughs> So part of doing this, you know, 
just this, this is probably amongst the closer we've come to actually painting in my own personal style in any other episode. And when I'm doing this, you could see that there's a difference between this painting and the original. I, I, I make, I, I, I give myself complete freedom to play with the original. I don't hold myself strictly to trying to do what already exists in a photograph. I allow myself freedom to, to play. I, I, and again, I, we, I say this almost every episode. This painting has to exist on its own as an artwork on its own. Unless I decide to hang the photograph right next to the painting so that people can see them side by side. And I have done artwork like that. In our, our uh, dining room upstairs, I have a painting I made at the North Pole with a photograph of the painting as I finished it on this little tiny easel. Um, and so you could see them side by side and I think I did a pretty good job. <laughs> <laughs> um, but generally, I don't hang a photograph, the original photograph, and then the painting that I'm, I'm making right next to, so you can see them side by side. Um, and so I've, th I have to make this work, and that's what I, I, I mention this all the time, but there's, at some point, I just have to go like, you know what, let's put that um, original away and focus on develop turning this into something that I'm happy with so sometimes you know if you're if I just leave the camera on like this you'll see that I rarely like the the image that I'm painting is over here and you'll see that at when I'm you know an hour or two into the art or into the process I, I, I the, the amount of time I'm looking at the original, slowly goes down, right? I see Deborah says she's going to bed. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Deborah, and for for uh, keeping me company, or and all of us company. I appreciate, I appreciate you and everything you bring to, to these streams and classes. It's great to have you along, and if you decided to make this painting. I can't wait to see what you created. Um, now, having said that I, I, I kind of stopped looking at the original after a certain point, um, I'm sure there's some people like, yeah, we kind of like, oh, that's why your paintings are look the way they do. It's because you just stop paying attention. Now, one thing I, you know, in retrospect, as I'm painting this, I think one thing I could have done some really nice um, blending of, of some kind of colors to really create a little bit more depth in, in this painting. Like when I look at the original, this photograph and this sloping behind here, I could have really done something kind of nice here with some kind of with different trend different areas pockets of but um, I don't know I'm, I'm also not uh, too un I'm, I'm kind of happy with the way things are turning out anyway so I'm gonna have to tackle that eventually I would have that vehicle back here I, think I need to do a little bit of work on that Ah, Deborah's p making a painting of her dancing on the moon. That is cool. I'm so excited to see how that turned out. Um, Josh asks, uh, during the, the moon trip, will you paint on the spaceship as well? Yeah, it would be absolutely. From the... In an adventure like that, I would just be working intensely. 
I, I will say one of the things I learned from painting in the fighter plane is I was drawing like constantly like once as soon as I got into the plane and they closed the cockpit and armed the ejection seat and all that kind of stuff and they do the, they run through the the all the the uh, the flight stuff and you can hear and like um, all that going on um, I was just I took my pencil out and I started drawing and I'll say the first five drawings or so that I did were awful and I started feeling <gasps> the panic of like I, everything's been building up to this moment and these drawings I'm making are terrible Ooh! you know and it's like which you know I, every artist goes through that feeling of of um you know you're working on something and it's not going the way you want to go and and you just want to give up but this the only way for me to give up would be to pull the the uh, ejection seat uh, lever and <laughs> explode out of the plane and parachute down which would uh, you know I, I don't they never said I would owe them any money if I did that but that would probably cost the Canadian taxpayers like millions and millions of dollars and <laughs> would not make me any friends <laughs> uh, I would be and then probably all those guys there would just think would, would just laugh endlessly I'd be the the artist who I, I felt like a lot of responsibility on those trips of sort of representing artists to um, to all of those uh, men and women in the military when I was part of the Canadian Forces Artist Program. Like, you can't help but feel they're all looking at you thinking like, huh, who is this kid? What's he going to do? He thinks he's pretty special, huh? You're going to come out here and make a, a drawing in a fire plane. Hmm. That should be, this should be good for a laugh. And, uh, and so it's, it was kind of, I was quite stressed out that I would have an experience and then they'd all get because afterwards everybody wanted to see you know everyone who knew what I was there's you know people know it's it's the Canadian military is much smaller than the, the American one or Chinese one or Russian one you know it's when people on the base know what you're up to everybody wants to to, to see it and uh, and people are understandably kind of skeptical so Ooh, I was a little bit nervous because <laughs> I felt like if I if I blew this, it I sort of I can end up blowing it for a lot of other artists who might follow or hope to follow in my footsteps, come after me. And, um, that wasn't that was a big part of that experience is that anxiety of not living up to the expectation my own expectations and quite frankly they had expectations too like just putting a bit of a highlight on here so this is a, a cool yellow with a bit of or with white and cool yellow which is, is kind of quite bright now when I look at it on the screen it doesn't look that bright it looks kind of muted but that's okay because when I especially when this starts getting darker up here any of the white is gonna really start popping and um, So it's, I don't want to go too bright too quick.
Okay. brush in order to make it more visible I'm just kind of giving it a bit of a brown quality if you can actually see that there's something in his hand That's kind of just a placeholder, a, a kind of a big blob of paint there. some colors on that palette there shortly um <laughs> part of me sort of wants to just paint like a mondrian or some kind of abstract painting on there but that would be maybe a little bit too silly Making a little bit another cool blue here. Let's get it. Nice and so slow dry medium on here.
kind of heavy-handed, Michael. But we can dial some of that back with some... Maybe we'll do a little bit of washes uh, on here, too. Okay, so I think maybe I've, I've got... Let me see. You know what, I'm going to take this same color. No, I won't. What should I... Yeah. Let's get a little more white on here. tackle this car in the background really quickly. Okay, I think it's time to do the, the sky or the blackness of space here. So to do that, I'm going to use a cool blue. And black. So I'm going to take my cool blue and black. Right now, this looks very, in, in, to my eyes, it still has a very bluish quality. But I think when we start brushing it in, those are dark and
that's going to need to dry a bit. You can see that I've made a decision to use um, a smaller brush to do this so that I could get the brush strokes. I don't, the way it looks on television is maybe not as as flattering to it as it looks um, in on my canvas right here. Um, on my canvas, I think it actually looks quite nice. Okay, there's there's things with this painting that I like more than others, and there's parts of it less so. So I think because of that, I'm going to take a, a bit of a break from it. And I'm just going to add some of the colors that would be on the palette here. cracks me up as it starts to kind of come together that's pretty darn funny actually maybe let's get some red on it fix that, that brush a bit there. I think that this needs to just be set aside and dry for a few minutes, and I'm going to come back to the other one. <laughs> I am really intrigued to see this Dancing on the Moon painting. Okay. So I'm going to do the same thing. Let's. I'm just going to put the, the sky in here first. 
So to paint this, I've just got my cool blue and black. And there's, um, this is a bit of a dirtier brush, so I just got it for some white on here. So it's it's not a f full black, it's, it's much more of a gray. Ah, my big head in the way the whole time. Jeez, my goodness. I have another T over here. I didn't even. That's good. I'm pumping the caffeine in here while I'm working away. Okay. So you know that sky right now is very brushy, and no, I'm not too happy with it. But we will go over it again here. So I'm wondering. See, now this, it's, it's gotten a little bit too heavy and dark there, but I'll take care of that. In fact, I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to make a gray that is very neutral, and I'll go back over some areas of the painting. So, get some paint out here. White. We got enough black on there. I mean, let me you need barely any black to to make these to to do make a gray, right? Black is such a dominant color. come in here and kind of touch this up a bit and kind of paint out some things 
and and not to like hide them but it's now I'm kind of putting a little bit more atmosphere into some of these areas they're all gonna kind of shine through what I'm painting on over top of It's like I'm uh, lowering the depth of field and kind of making a few things back here slightly out of focus. Mixed feelings about the way things are going right now. I'm just sort of, I guess, I was looking at this and just, I didn't like what was happening here. It was an opportunity for me to just I don't know, it's, I wouldn't say I'm like painting it all out. I just want to integrate some of this stuff a little bit better. I'm pretty 
a bit more of a focus back And it's really hard to say whether I'm improving the painting or ruining the painting. Really hard to tell sometimes. Uh. It was a little bit closer to my vision. Okay, I have no idea what this looks like for people at home, but.
This is definitely, you know, I, you know, I'm, I talk about this all the time, but you know, when you're working on a painting, there's, it's like that roller coaster feeling of, and trust me, I get it pretty extreme because I'm doing this on live camera and, you know, people are tuning in and out and some people tune in maybe for the first and last time. They just go like, oh my god, that is the worst pile of slop I've ever seen. And then some other people might tune in and be like, wow, that's genius. And then they tune in the week later like, whoa, I guess uh, he just was lucky that one time. Everything else since has been just terrible. And... Nothing you can do about that. Nothing I can do about other people's reactions to my artwork. And, you know, I, I am not really looking at the original, which, you know, I often tell my students, look at the original, that's where all the answers are. But, you know, it's also, sometimes you just gotta look away and just, especially when you're at this point in a painting. Like, I'm just using the, the dirty brush and just wiping my dirty brush around the canvas in a number of places. Some of this is a little too soft back here. So I should probably actually be using a smaller brush. Actually, I should wait for some of this to dry, I think. And just move on to the other painting for a little bit. Get a fresh... A fresh... Uh, point of view on it. Okay.
Yeah, that's right. I squeeze all the tea out of these tea bags that have been sitting in here for a few hours. <sighs> Drink it right to the last drop. Okay. Let's do this astronaut. Okay. So I'm going to use... Let's mix up some of this purple again. So where should we start? <laughs> probably going to be painting here for a long time, folks. Oh, my goodness. But this one was one that uh, I really wanted to do on my own anyway. I've been putting it off forever.
So now I just took some of the warm blue, a little bit of black, and some medium. And I've got all this gray around here, so it's not really pure black. It's just there's some more black in there. So you can see. And I can use this dark one here to... Oh, this is pretty silly. The whole idea is, is I totally understand why some people were pretty skeptical of this whole concept. For sure. 
sure. It didn't surprise me that uh, I got the reaction I did. I hate it when I look up and I see my big head in the screen. Take a look at this other one, see how it's going. Um, I need to mix a brown. Crazy, there's still people watching me right now. Oh my goodness, you guys are troopers! I'm so excited. I, 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 so in, like curious to see what what you guys are working on. Um, okay. So I'm gonna make another brown. So I'm gonna take my cool yellow, cool red, or sorry, warm yellow. Warm red, warm blue. Mix that together, need a little bit more blue. So it's a really, I like this brown a lot, but it, if I paint this brown right now, on here it's just gonna stick out like a really sore, sore, sore thumb. So we're going to put some gray into this brown here. We'll put some slow dry medium on there. Okay. And the reason I'm mixing that is I want this darker brown for uh, let's say the back side of the easel here
just to kind of give this one a little bit of a different vibe. I'm just gonna put a little bit of blue in there. You know, it doesn't bother me if this easel has looks a little wobbly and strange, that's totally fine. I don't. Uh, it has. Like, seem is kind of irrelevant to me, really, honestly. Because while there are some artists who make uh, whose whole thing is painting very realistically, personally, I always think it's like you know if you can if you like we have photography for that you know if you want to make something that looks bang on one hundred percent perfect go go take a photograph that'll work great. There's some weirdness with the way that I've painted this in terms of where the light is coming from. My instinct would be to make that much darker. Okay, so to make it this brown darker, I'm going to take the cool blue and warm blue. Let's even add a bit of black in here. Even though I like how that looks, to be honest, it's The painting asked for it, so we gotta deliver.
I really like the kind of the wobbliness of it. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. feels much much better I want to do these sh get some darkness in this shadow So to get this darker shadow, I'm taking warm blue and some black.
I, mean, I gotta say, like, there's, I, I kind of like it as it is. It is, it is different, very different than the original. Think about that. I, I I could be convinced to leave that alone. That would be it's possible. Like I think what I like about this painting in this current state is it's it's very arty. <laughs> it's it's not as like it's not accurate to the uh, to the photo. But there is something weird about it that uh, I'm clearly attracted to. I am almost tempted to just leave it and then think about it and paint more on it at a different time. I don't know. It's so hard to say sometimes. <clears throat> uh, I think I do want to touch up the sky. More cool blue. Okay, so I'm gonna take cool blue and the dark and the dark black, the black. Let's put some slow dry medium on here. I was originally going to put like rays of of like sunlight um, radiating around um,
also kind of really like just the, the darkness of space. And this is not even fully black. It's kind of... Uh, kind of kind of digging that I'm digging it <laughs> I, I imagine probably most people wouldn't So I accidentally picked up a bit of white on my palette as I was mixing this. So, but I decided let's just see when we start painting with it, what effect it has. Negligible. Two very different paintings so far. So interesting. That really helped. Like it's it's so interesting how you do one thing here and then that affects other parts of the painting that are just total have nothing to do nowhere near that that area constantly surprised i i mean that's one of the reasons why i love painting is it's just like constant surprise Um, I'm not stopping just yet. I, I do. I'm just going to take a minute just to just look at these side by side. And think about them. You know, now, okay, so these are, th these are very personal paintings to me. And these are paintings that, that um, I want to use for um, the purposes of this, of my actual artwork as projects. So, I think, I think what I'm going to do 
is continue working on them, potentially even later tonight. If I decide to do that, I might even stream myself working on them a little bit more. But I, I think that what I want to do is just is just leave them and think about them. Um, because I, I, I am drawn to to want to leave them alone, and to. So I just I'm having to think to myself, like especially this one here. There's something about the, the the way that I've painted this that I like. It feels like it kind of says everything that needs to be said and is doing it. Even though the colors are not exactly correct. This one, too, I feel... Um, you know, some of this in here... Is not... I'm not super happy with doesn't have the looseness of this it kind of it feels a little bit overworked in these areas <clears throat> so I mean it's like little things so I love the way I did that little car up here I don't know I gotta think about it I gotta think about it and man I've been on here forever so um I am. I, I. I need to put these up. Look at them for a while, which is what I always suggest everybody do when you're making a painting. Sometimes you just need to step back, hang them on the wall for a little bit, or prop them up. Sit down, pour yourself a glass of wine. I don't drink, but uh, have a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, some chamomile or soda water, whatever you need. Um, you grab your space snack. Make sure you get some space snack on your paintings for authenticity, just like I just did. And then, um, and just think about it. Okay. <laughs> You're sitting here watching me eat. Okay. So, I'm going to call it a day, folks. I'm probably going to work on them a little bit, selectively. But, um... I need to do I need to do that right now ah! I do want to sometimes it's very hard just to walk away Man, it must be raining really hard out there. I can hear the rain from in here, which is usually not the case. around here. I'm already having regrets for having done, for not just having walked away when I had the chance.
I should have just walked away, shouldn't I? I had it all queued up and ready to sign off, and then here I am. Still painting away, darn it.
Interesting. Okay, let's see these. Let's do this again. I think I think it uh, ultimately <laughs> was a good choice to do some of this.
Okay. <laughs> it's just... Okay, I, I am going to <laughs> call it a day before I do anything more. I, I like where everything's gone. I need to think about my next steps if I want to do any more next steps. So, maybe it's time to sign a few of these. There's the hey, uh, paint on the moon, too. Are you kidding me, Michael? See how the worst things always happen right before you're about to call it a day. See if uh, that dries well enough that I'll remember where that mistake happened. Two very different paintings, that's for sure. Okay, everybody. I'm I'm depleted, so <laughs> I'm going to call it a day. Thank you so much for joining me. If you like it, please like, subscribe. If you want to leave a donation down below, there's all these things. Look at my hands moving around. I'm losing my mind. We will see you next week, our master study episode. We're looking at Sherry Boyle. It's going to be awesome. And then I think if I'm correct next week's paint the news i want to talk about uh tolkien reading day jrr tolkien reading day is coming up what is that we're gonna find out we're gonna make i think a really cool painting i'm pretty pumped about that one okay everybody enjoy the rest of your evening and we will see you again very very soon